Romans chapter 3 is where the text will be found tonight. chapter 3 and verse 21, we'll continue to read through these following verses. And again, as I've mentioned before, um, this is by way of, I guess I would say introduction, but we're still teaching, uh, introducing the teaching that we're headed towards in the sixth chapter of Romans. Uh, but we're going to deal with this third chapter, dealing with the great subject of justification by faith. Uh, going on to the, sub the subject of sanctification uh, by faith. Romans chapter 6, I'm sorry, I'm already ready to go there. Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God by faith, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned. Somebody say amen. amen. For all have sinned. Somebody say amen again. Amen. And come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. And we're going to stop the reading there and continue. Over and over and over again, you've heard it taught uh, by many of us uh, concerning faith and grace, uh, the righteousness of God. <clears throat> the subject matter in the book of Romans, as we continue to study it, uh, is righteousness. The subject matter in the book of Romans is righteousness. And as we approach it, there are several things that we've got to uh, address and look at in this particular letter. Uh, number one, who is the audience of the letter? Now, if you read the book of Acts, you'll remember that by this time that Paul wrote this letter, Paul has not yet visited Rome. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, Paul was uh, anticipating a visit. And finally, at the book of, uh, book of Acts, as it closes out, closes out, you'll see Paul finally uh, taking that long-awaited trip to Rome. But as you read this letter, Paul had not yet visited them, so of course, he was not the founding pastor of the Church of Rome. However, when you read Romans, the date of the letter is not, of course, the first letter that Paul wrote. And I've said it each session, and I'm going to say it again tonight by way of review, the reason that it is placed first among the epistles is because of the explanation of the gospel. In the book of Romans, I'll say it this way, if we understand Romans, we will understand our salvation. If you understand the book of Romans, you'll begin to open up, it'll open up to you what God did for you through Jesus Christ at Calvary and how he brought you into covenant relationship with him. This is a miracle because everyone sitting in this place tonight or everyone who has ever been born with the exception of Jesus Christ is guilty of breaking God's law. How can God, and the text will bear this out, be just in justifying a guilty sinner? I want you to keep that question in mind tonight. How can God be a just God who is righteous, who has a perfect standard of righteous? How can he be just 
and in declaring you innocent, righteous, and perfect, how can God call you perfect when you haven't been perfect? How can God call you righteous when you haven't been righteous? How can God say that you have never sinned when clearly all of us in here, let's read verse 23 again. We're going to keep reading that tonight. For all have sinned. Let the church say amen. amen. All have sinned. So how can God declare you righteous when the Bible just said that all have sinned? I mean, that baffles the natural mind, and it's hard to understand. What, but, but the spiritual mind, of course, it shouldn't be because we embrace through faith what Christ did for us. Everyone in this place, whether you're young or old, you need to understand your salvation. Uh, the reason a lot of times we lose our fire, the le reason a lot of times we lose sight and there's no joy in us is because we don't understand what we have. Yeah. Right. Think about it. How many people you know have an inheritance and they're not happy about it? Have you ever met someone who came into a huge trust fund or came into a whole lot of money and they weren't happy about it? Somebody left something for them. Well, how did they get it? Somebody had to do what? Die. And the reason that they have, that's right, man, amen. I got one now. Teach us, teach us. The reason that we don't have the joy of the Lord is because we don't understand what God did for us through Christ Jesus. It's not just simply something we wave at. It's not just something we simply, well, amen, and you go to church Sunday and you go out. This, what you receive, can carry you through every aspect of life and every aspect of your day, every insult that you face, every problem that you face, we should be drawing strength from what we received, from what Jesus did for us at Calvary. Amen. Think about that for a moment. Everything that I need, everything that I stand in need of, the Lord has purchased it for me through his son Jesus at Calvary. So as we read the letter, the study begins to unfold to us. Number one, everybody's guilty. Somebody say, me too. Amen. Everybody is guilty. That's the subject here of Romans. Everybody is, I'm being very practical and speaking in very layman terms. If you read Romans, you'll come to the conclusion that the whole world, Romans chapter 3, is guilty before God. Why are there differences? Why do we put so many tags and hierarchy low in the church, but the Bible says there is no difference? How did we get to this place where we start making a difference between people? Because man got his hand in the redemptive plan of God. But I'm, the scripture teaches us that there is no difference. In other words, all men are sinners. Therefore, all men can be saved. The people who you don't like can be saved. The people who we don't get along with can be saved. The person you're resentful towards, God will forgive that person. Can I get a witness right there? The person you don't want to let go of that offense, God will forgive that person. Because nobody controls God. No one has the final verdict over a soul other than God. So the reality is all men are sinners and all men can and will if they will accept Jesus Christ be saved. The righteousness of God is what we need. All men are guilty. All men are condemned and stand in need of salvation. All men are condemned and stand in need of salvation. You didn't get saved until there was a time in your life you realized you were lost. If you're sitting in this place tonight and you haven't come to grips with that,
life, there has to be a decision made. That's right. There has to be conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit and an, and an acknowledgement in your heart that Jesus Christ is the way. I am a sinner and I am in need of salvation. It is at that moment that God makes you the righteousness of God. It is at that moment that God can legally justify you. Upon all them who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. It is grace, he, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, for by grace are you saved. Think about this for just a moment. Grace is unearned. You don't deserve what God did. The word freely there means without just cause. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. The word freely there means that someone did a kind act on your behalf out of the goodness of their heart. You didn't deserve it. You can't afford to pay for it. But out of the goodness of his heart, while we were yet sinners, he died for us at Calvary. I don't know about you, but there should be an, a constant joy and excitement. You should be excited when you're at home. Right. If you wait till you get it to right. church and get freely. He justified us without just cause. Birth simply out of his unconditional love for humanity. That's why when the Bible talks about love, it talks about God's love. When the Bible talks about the love that we should have for our brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not talking about
There is yeah. no probation. There is no, well, let me watch you for six to eight months. Yeah. Well, let me watch yeah. you for nine months, and then I'll give you all. No, when you got your job, think about it. You had to work the 90 yeah. days yeah. or six months before yeah. they gave you benefits. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. They had to find out who you were. Think about it now. When you got your job, they gave you what they gave you based on your performance. Right. When you got saved, God gave you what he gave you based on somebody else's performance. Yeah. Come, on now. Come on now. Based on what Jesus did at Calvary, you received every benefit of somebody that's been in this thing for 50 years. At the moment you got saved, you received every single thing that you needed to live this Christian life. That's right. Justification. Justified. And there is a legal standing that you have before God and is one of being righteous. Freely. Think about it now. How could God do that? This is what the text says. He justified you freely by just cause. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Through the purchasing blood of Christ, God could justify you freely. Through what Christ did at Calvary. And then he said, he said, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set why you and I are here tonight and have a relationship with God. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter your color. Doesn't matter any of those things. Right. What matters is, is faith. Yeah. Faith in what Christ did. Verse 22, I want to keep hammering this point home. Even the righteousness of God, which is how? By faith in Jesus Christ. You are righteous because you believe something. What is righteous? Being right with God. Right considering what God calls right and not what you and I call right. Mm -hmm. Now I know sometimes the actions don't measure up. Right now I'm talking about your position. Yeah. Right. There you go. I want you to make sure you understand it. Tonight I'm dealing with your position in Christ. I'm not so much tonight dealing with activity and and your actions and all of that, obviously your position should dictate your actions. Think about that. Where you are will should dictate how you act if you're truly there. You think you can walk in the Oval Office right now and act how you want to act? Think about what I just said. I don't care who the president is. Get that out of your mind. That's There's right. a certain way you're going to act if you That's go to the White House. That's That's right. Right. That's right. If you visit the King of Queen of England, yeah. there's a certain way you're going to have to act. You ever heard there are restaurants that have dress codes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means you got to change the way you do things just to go here. <laughs> your position alters your condition. Think about that. That's what Romans 6 is telling you. Your position in Christ should alter your activity. So you, you can't get this, I'm saved, but. No, there's no but. Either you're saved or you're not. That's right. yeah. God knows my heart. No, either you're saved or you're not. Right. And when you're saved, guess what? God, the Holy Spirit, cleans you up right. because of your position. You're in Christ now. You're in a position where the Holy Spirit can work in you and through you. Before yeah. you got saved, you weren't in that position. Yeah, you right. that Remember, you got benefits. You got a benefit package when you got saved. Sure and part of that package says the Holy Spirit is in your heart and life. And he's what is he doing there? He's affecting change in you, yeah. which is called sanctification. That's right. Yeah. Right on it, bro. Because you're justified. Because you're freely justified. Because you're righteous. He is working on you, bringing your condition up to your standing. Right. 
you're safe. The wind can blow, you're safe. You stumble and fail, you're safe. I know self-righteous people don't like to hear that, sure but you are safe. Amen. I want you to get that tonight because it takes faith to believe that. Don't you let the devil tell you you're not saved because you blew it. Come on. If you're not saved when you blew it, then we all are lost tonight. Amen. But you're not lost because you blew it. Paul is going to go on in chapter 4 and bring an example of justification that's not too favorable to the self-righteous heart. It's easy to talk about Abraham because he was justified before the law of Moses was given. He had a legal standing before God. How? Because Galatians 3.8 says God preached the gospel unto Abraham. Genesis 15.6 says uh, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him to, for righteousness. Think about that for a moment. Romans, I'm not, sorry, not Romans, but John chapter 8, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah, yeah, and when Abraham heard about my day, he yeah. saw it. Sure and what was it? He was glad. Amen. Think about that now. Amen. Thousands of years before Amen. Jesus came, Abraham heard that through his family line, a redeemer would come. He died believing that a man would come through him that would save the world from their sin. Can you imagine that faith? That's why Christianity is a mystery to the world. Yeah. You don't see Muslims being persecuted like Christians. Let's stop That's and think right. about it for a moment. Christianity is the most persecuted, quote-unquote, religion in the world. We're looking back 2,000 years yeah. Yeah. to an event, a man who died on a tree, who was esteemed by men to be cursed and smitten of God. But to God, it was a sweet smelling Savior. Oh my God, you think about that for a moment. To God, when he died there, the, the sin offering in the Old Testament, they had to take the animal outside of the camp. What did Jesus have to do? They took him outside of Jerusalem and hung him on the tree. He was the sin offering. And then he was the whole burnt offering. They had to take the whole animal and put him on the altar and burn him with fire. Jesus, God gave his all when Jesus died on the cross. And when that, my God, you got to hear me tonight. You got something. You got something. And then he was the peace offering. Because of all of the sin, peace had to be made. Therefore, Romans chapter 5, being justified freely by his grace, we have what? Peace with God because Jesus is our peace offering. He's the thanksgiving offering. He's where praise comes from. He's where thanksgiving comes from. What is that for? Thank you, Lord, for dying for me. Thank you, Lord. That's why the psalmist said, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and his courts with praise. Why? Because they could see the smoke from the altar. They knew atonement had been made and it brought peace. Not only that, but when the priests were consecrated, because you couldn't work in God's house without being consecrated. You had to come encounter with the blood and the oil. Come on now. You got to have the anointing. You got to have the blood of Jesus. You got to have the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Guess what they did? They killed animals. They cut them up and they took part of it. And you know what the priests would do? They would wave it. Why would they do that? It was a sign of thanksgiving. And that's why today, when you and I do this, it's a wave offering. Right. Oh my God. You got to think about everything is tied into the cross. That's why, let me look at me for just a moment. That's why when you sit here like this in church, I can't understand that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, don't get mad at me. I just want to talk to you for a minute. Oh, there is a response yeah. in relationship. Talk to me tonight. Yeah. There is a response yeah. in your relationship. Yeah. Stop telling me you're married and you don't ever go home. <laughs> Stop telling me you love your, your husband or your wife and y'all don't ever talk. There is a response in your your relationship. Can I get a witness in here tonight? There's a response. Why did you go to your job this morning? Because that's your response to the relationship. When you go to house, the house of God, there's a response where everybody don't do that. Yes, they do. Because you are washed in the blood. You may not run and shout, but by God, something ought to be 
be in you, yeah. and I will make you do this sometime. Yeah. Because I thank you yeah. for what you did for me. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Well, that's not etiquette. <laughs> I'm sure Jesus hanging on a cross naked was an etiquette. Mm. But he did it. Why? Because our, so our uppity selves could be saved. Yeah. And the least we could do is praise him. Yeah. Come on now. The least that you can do is say thank you. I mean, we are people who should be living in thank you. Yeah. Right. Amen. Your whole life should be thank you. Yeah. Why do you think, you know, sometimes we, well, he, he just too deep. Well, she just, I mean, think, man, think about it for me. When you get insulted, yeah. sometimes you say, well, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I need that kind of maturity. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Come on. I mean, I'm not all the way there yet, but I'm looking for it. I've seen people get cursed out from everything, get called everything, and they start saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you for counting me worthy to suffer. I'm looking for that kind of response. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Are you saved tonight? Do you have relationship with God through Jesus Christ? There's no other way to go. Let's, I feel this dig a little deeper. Can, can, can I praise? I won't let me pick on me. I can get happy here, but what about when I'm sitting over here when somebody else is preaching? Okay. Mm. Come on. Uh -oh. Come on. Uh -oh. you, you can get happy up here, but what about when you're not singing? Uh -oh. What about when you're not playing? What about when you're not preaching? What about when you're not on the door? Can you still have a response? Anybody can function, but function is not relationship. Oh, you got to hear me tonight. Anybody can have a gift and move a crowd. Anybody yeah. can stand up here and be, I heard Barack Obama chant, yes, we can, for an hour straight. I saw people crying and running, and nobody got saved. Yeah. How is that problem? Because he had a gift to yeah. talk to folks. Yeah. But nobody was delivered that yeah. night. But you can take an uneducated man yeah. like Smith Wigglesworth and yeah. baptize him with the Holy Ghost, yeah. and he will preach the gospel, and souls yeah. will get saved. Why? Because the anointing destroys the yoke. Yeah. 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 That's why this is not based mm. on activity. This is not based on amen. You think you're going to stand up here and preach because everybody's going to say amen? Mm. <laughs> sometimes you'll stand up here and folks will be mad at you. Oh, and sometimes wow. you got to sit out there and be mad. Sometimes yeah. he'll stand up here and be mad at you. Yeah. But guess what we're all trying to go? We're trying to get to heaven. Yeah. Get over it. Yeah. Come on. Listen to me. Freely. Without just cause. Freely. I can't leave it alone. Without just cause. But look at us. We base everything on activity. You know, Brother Mike didn't speak to me. <laughs> now six weeks go by and you still can't talk to him because you're not freely giving what God freely gave you. But when maturity begins, that's why I said this, and that's what God's been dealing with me about. Listen, it's one thing to have this doctrine Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. We need doctrine. But when will it become application? Yeah. yeah. Tory. Is what you know going to express itself in your activity, mm -hmm. in your relationships, in your character with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Wow. You'll live in this freely. He justified me based on what Christ did because he sent Jesus forth to be a reconciliation. Think about it. Through faith in his blood to declare righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just. Now let's talk about that. We asked the question at the beginning, how can God call you innocent? Can you imagine the justice system of America, which we know is flawed? Yeah. There have been people, they had all the evidence in the world, and they still got off. How? Sure. Somebody must have had a lot of money. I don't know. <laughs> 32 eyewitnesses. No, not guilty. That doesn't happen with God. No. You know. can't wiggle your way out. There you go. Right. Boy, you read on. The song said, justice demanded that I should die. Yeah. But grace and mercy said, oh no, 
<laughs> We've already paid the price. Yeah. What is justice? This word. Yeah. Thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> Somebody said, well, I've never stolen. <laughs> I've never killed. Let's go here then. And everybody just say amen. <laughs> Thou shalt not bear false witness. So I said, what is that? Thou shalt not lie. Amen. amen. That's right. Everybody say amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. Come on now. You breaking it down. Right. Get them. You breaking it down. Now. Come on with it. But, but think about it. Ten Commandments, simply a moral code, a moral standard was given by God to man. And when man saw it, you know what they did? They said, all that the Lord said, we will do. Before they could get it out of their mouth, they failed. Sure, they stumbled. Yeah. But what did God do? What did God provide? God provided a sacrificial system. Not because he thought man may mess up, so I need to put this in place just in case. No. He knew they couldn't keep the law. He knows you can't keep his moral code. He knows you can't live up to perfection that is in Christ. But guess what he did? He said, I'll become man. I'll keep it for you. Think about this. Hebrews said he wrote the law across your heart. In the mind of God, you have never broken a commandment. I don't know if y'all got that yet. In the mind of God, you have never violated his word. That's deep now. How can he say that about me? Because your representation never broke the law. So your past is in Christ Jesus. Your present is in Christ Jesus. You better hope I'm right. You better hope I'm right. Your present is in him and your future is in him. Everything about you is in Christ. He is, how can he be just when he doesn't overlook sin? You can't get away with sin. God doesn't overlook sin. So how can he be just in declaring a sinner righteous? Think about the book of John. A woman caught in the act of adultery. In the very act, never mind the man, the man was never brought. Think about that for a moment. She was caught in the act and she was taken to Christ against her will. She was taken to Christ. I never thought about it. Brother Lauren brought out a point. He asked the question. He said, how did she get there? thought about it for a moment. I said, man, I've never thought about that. How did she? Because she didn't want to go see Jesus. They had to drag her. Yeah. Kicking and screaming. Against her will. They drag her to humiliate her in front of Christ. And listen, they knew that they had Jesus cornered now. Because the law said if you were caught in adultery, you would have been stoned to death. He said, Jesus, I want you, I want you to stay with me, please. We caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Now the law says she needs to be killed. Yeah. But what do you say? <laughs> Jesus, I want listen to the saints. Listen to me. Listen. She kneeled down on the ground. Jesus kneeled down on the ground. And they begin to write on the ground. He asked the woman, he said this to all of the men. He said, those who are here without sin, <laughs> cast the first stone. And because this was straight <coughs> to them, guess what they did? Yeah. They had to drop the stones yeah. and they had to walk away. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus asked the question. He said, where are those who condemn you? <laughs> she said, there are none. And the woman said, there are none. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How could Jesus let this woman go? Knowing that she was supposed to die. Because of this. Because he knew in just a few days. Yeah. 
in her place, he would die. I want you to hear me tonight. If you're here in this place, you're hearing me. That's the only way God can be just in justifying you. Yeah. Think about it. He can be fair. He can be just in not violating his word in one hour by looking at what Jesus did yeah. in your place, That's in it. my Lord, place. Right. He was perfect. Amen. He kept God's law perfectly. Mm. And he died in your place as our substitute. And you know what God did for you? He said, go and sin no more. And now you have a position that's in Christ Jesus that's perfect, that's righteous, that's holy, without spot, without any blemish. Your position, remember, keep that in mind because I'm talking about your position. Your position is perfect. Yeah. And it cannot be changed. No man can pluck you out of the hand of God. Think about what I just said now. That's right. They may not like you. You may have failed and blew it. You don't have to tell the world about it. That's right. That's right. But in the mind of God, because you still have faith, yeah, and you it. dare to get up from oh, that. And keep your faith. And this is for the, the 10, 11, yeah. and to the 60 year. It doesn't matter who you are. I want you to hear me tonight. Listen, you are called out. You are a royal priesthood. You are yeah. a chosen generation. You are marked. You have been purchased. I want you to hear me. You can't live like everybody else. Amen. Come on. That rebellion can come and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'll live how I want to live. Let me give you an example. This is going to be very practical, but watch how you do it. You ever had music turned up while you were rebellious? But you saw a saint come by and you turned it down? Because you knew better. Come on, talk to me tonight. I saw folks who said, I'll do what I want to do with a cigarette in their hand. But as soon as they saw the saints, they put the cigarette down. Why? Because there's conviction. You can't outrun it. The Holy Ghost will get you if you belong to it. You can't go out and do what you want to do when you have a position. Get a, you, they tell you, you got to be at work at 6. Get there at 830 tomorrow. You'll be in the supervisor's office sitting there. Y'all know that meeting nobody yeah. wants to sit in because they're never there when you get there. They're always in another meeting waiting. Yeah. Then they come in and say, we need to talk to you. Guess what they're going to do? You're going to have to go because you can't do what you want to do and keep this job. You can't do what you want to do and then say, I'm saved. You've got a position that gave you benefits. We are without excuse. Because of the position that we have. Mm. We'll get to it in chapter 12 through 16. Practical application. There's no sense in talking about stop smoking, stop drinking, stop gambling. And you don't know what you have. But when you start knowing what you have, you think about a child. You think about your child. You tell them every day, hey, hey, take the trash out. Sweep the floor. Every day. Y'all don't look at your kids. Let me do that. <laughs> By week six, you flip out. Why? Because you are expecting change. Yeah. Right. Why can I expect? Because you know better now. Yeah. I, am, I, am I talking to anybody in here? You can't claim ignorance when you're hearing the truth. That's right. Much is required. Well, they don't like me. That's not what God's going to want to hear. What did you do with my son? Right. Amen. That's what it is. Right on. You have a position that's in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight. Amen. Amen. Oh. We give you glory. We